Chronic kidney disease has quietly grown into one of the most pressing public health crises of our time. Affecting more than 35 million adults in the United States alone, CKD is often underdiagnosed and undertreated, progressing silently until it reaches advanced stages and eventual kidney failure. With rates of key risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, and obesity continuing to rise, the burden of kidney disease is expected to increase in coming years, further straining healthcare systems and affecting millions of lives. Despite its widespread impact, CKD remains largely unrecognized by the general public, delaying critical interventions that could slow disease progression and improve outcomes. Without earlier detection and more effective interventions, the trajectory of CKD will only worsen. While recent advances in diagnostics, therapeutics, and public awareness efforts offer hope for changing this narrative, closing the gaps in CKD care will require coordinated efforts from multiple stakeholders. While significant strides have been made, the work is far from finished. This is Crisis Point. There are really three things that you need to remember when we talk about CKD and why it's a public health crisis today. First, CKD is extremely common, as I'll uh, elucidate. The consequences of CKD can be really devastating, both from an economic perspective and from a personal perspective. Um, and three, the fact that a lot of people don't know about it uh, leads to CKD often being undiagnosed and reaching advanced stages. Almost one in seven adults, or approximately 35 million people uh, in the United States today are estimated to have CKD. And many people, even as much as 90% of these people, don't really know that they have the disease. And when they don't know it, they aren't able to take steps to stem the progress of it. And that results in advanced kidney disease. And right now, more than 800,000 Americans have advanced kidney disease and kidney failure. Uh, we think it's uh, probably a billion people in the world. Uh, we know that the prevalence is increasing. We know that mortality, um, the list on the mortality list goes, uh, gets higher and higher, right? So it's expected to be the fifth cause of mortality in the world by 2040. In some places, it's already fifth. And um, so we're seeing uh, more people we're seeing younger people with the disease. We're seeing uh, newer risk factors such as heat stress. And so everything is pointing in a direction, unfortunately, which is, which is bad, right? So, so um, it, it's, it's, it, it was a crisis beforehand. It's even a greater crisis today. Many have asked the question, how did we get here? The unfortunate answer is that there is no single driver of this growing public health crisis, making it even more difficult to address. A major factor in the rise of chronic kidney disease is the growing prevalence of obesity and diabetes, both of which significantly increase the risk of CKD. As these epidemics have surged, so too has the number of people developing kidney disease, often without symptoms or awareness until significant damage has occurred. This epidemic of proportions that we're seeing is really linked, I think, to the increased prevalence of diabetes and blood pressure, which are really the most common causes of CKD in the United States. High blood sugar and diabetes damage the blood vessels of the kidneys and the glomeruli, the filters of the kidneys. And this impairs the ability of the kidneys really to do their natural work, which is remove toxins, regulate blood pressure, uh, excrete sodium, and remove any excess fluid. And this is really further complicated by the overlap of diabetes and high blood pressure with obesity. And this is because each of these conditions individually can damage the kidneys. Uh, I already told you how high blood pressure and diabetes affect the kidneys, and just obesity can put an extra strain on the kidney and damage the filter. And so managing each of these conditions individually and together are really critical in stemming the uh, increasing prevalence and incidence of CKD. So the interaction between cardiovascular disease and kidney disease has been long uh, recognized and uh, the American Heart Association had a presidential advisory for the cardiovascular kidney and metabolic syndrome that uh, really highlights this interaction and that sedentary living, um, lack of physical activity, uh, visceral adipose tissue or abdominal adipose tissue, monocytes uh, with uh, cytokine and adipokines uh, causing microinflammation and that resulting in a vicious cycle of uh, cardiovascular disease and kidney disease and uh, uh, type 2 diabetes, um, as well as uh, dyslipidemia that lead to the 
cardiovascular complications and the kidney complications. I'm thinking about how we can approach individuals um, that present with uh, cardiovascular problems to assess their kidney status and patients with kidney disease uh, to assess their cardiovascular status and re reduce cardiovascular risk is going to be an important part of um, managing this. And then there's a prevention aspect as well. Early detection and treatment are critical in the fight against chronic kidney disease. Because CKD often progresses silently, many patients don't realize they have it until significant kidney damage has already occurred. By the time symptoms appear, treatment options become more limited, and the risk of complications dramatically increases. When CKD is identified early, interventions can slow disease progression and improve long-term outcomes. Prioritizing early detection introduces the opportunity to shift the trajectory of CKD, keeping more patients off dialysis and preserving kidney function for years to come. Early detection and treatment of CKD are really crucial. And that's because the disease is silent, and so symptoms are often not known until the disease is quite advanced, usually at an, almost an irreversible stage. But if we can actually detect CKD early, progression can be slowed. There are several new treatments that are being developed, and so the time to progress to kidney failure can be prevented or at least you know, pushed back by several years or even decades. Because by the time symptoms such as loss of appetite or fatigue or swelling or high blood pressure develop, most of the kidney function that can be preserved is lost and necessitates starting dialysis or planning for a kidney transplant. This is a disease that um, when identified early, um, either through lifestyle modifications or if it's at uh, uh, certain stages through uh, various medications that are now available, that you can slow down the progression of disease. Um, and uh, that's the goal. The goal is to stop the progression of the disease if it started. Um, and for many people is to, to, for it to, to, to catch it very, very early on. So they may not, never need to be on a medication. I think with early detection, I would think about this in a number of ways. One way is with lifestyle modification. So is the person aware that they have kidney disease and are they empowered to do something about it? Um, can they work on a healthy diet and physical activity. Uh, we can have a dietitian for medical nutrition therapy in the United States to help with the nutrition aspect. Tobacco cessation uh, is part of this and has been shown at least epidemiologically to uh, be helpful in terms of reducing um, kidney disease progression or associated with less kidney disease progression. We have many pharmacological therapies now. It's kind of an exciting time in nephrology. We have a, a new a kidney protective medicine. So we have ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers for hypertension with albuminuria. We have SGLT2 inhibitors for both diabetic type 2 diabetes and people without um, diabetes and kidney disease, especially if there's albuminuria. We have a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, the non-steroidal one for type 2 diabetes. Um, and now we have the GLP-1 receptor agonists as of yesterday. Uh, with the uh, semaglutide being approved for a um, type 2 diabetes uh, kidney indication based on the flow randomized controlled trial. So um, we have multiple interventions. Despite the known benefits of early CKD detection, routine screening remains inconsistent, leaving millions undiagnosed. At the same time, limited public awareness means many individuals at risk aren't seeking early medical attention, missing the opportunity for interventions that could slow or even prevent disease progression. The biggest challenge is, I, I would say, awareness. Um, uh, we are finding everywhere that we are in the world, whether it's a, uh, a developed country or an emerging market, that people are unaware, right? So, um, you know, their best case scenario is 10% of people with CKD in a particular country are aware of th that they have CKD. There are places in Turkey where um, there are reports where about 2% of people with CKD are aware of it, right? So there's an awareness issue. People are asymptomatic for the most part early on, and the awareness is on the patient side, right? So people don't think about this disease. Aya Best is one of millions of U.S. adults who knew little about kidney disease until she was diagnosed with it, eventually needing dialysis and a transplant. I was pregnant and going through routine tests that you do as a pregnant person through a different provider, right? Through an OBGYN. And there was a flag raised based on my urine culture. It showed proteinuria or elevated protein in my urine. 
Um, however, that's not enough information to attribute what the cause is. Um, but they were certain that it wasn't as a result of the pregnancy. They assumed that or suspected some type of kidney disease. At that point, I was given some options, you know, either proceed on with the pregnancy, um, knowing that would be high risk and that I would experience some comorbidities as a result, hypertension, potentially preeclampsia, um, or I could um, terminate the pregnancy and go straight to biopsy um, and really try to figure out what was causing this and really attack it head on. Um, I continued on with the pregnancy. I have a nine-year-old now and um, I did experience hypertension. I was diagnosed with preeclampsia, preterm labor. Um, and I was also told that my kidney disease would be exasperated or my disease progression would advance if I continued the pregnancy. Uh, six weeks postpartum amidst breastfeeding as I was back at the same hospital for which I delivered her, um, Mount Sinai in New York. And I got a biopsy and it was confirmed that I had IgAN or immunoglobulin autoimmune nephropathy. And um, it's an autoimmune disease, so no real cause or cure. There are suspicions out there. And at that point, I was a new mom. I was going back to work and I kind of um, didn't really understand the implications and the severity of the disease. I didn't really know much about it. And I kind of was in a little bit of a state of denial, maybe just a lack of understanding. You know, I had some symptoms that I can now attribute to IGAN, but typically they're very dormant or not necessarily attributable to something that you would think is a disease, something flagging, you know, fatigue and maybe just itchy skin or loss of appetite, things that you would think are just onset from stress or being a new mom. So it was really hard me to understand what was attributable to the CKD and what was postpartum and what was just life. This has been part one of HCP Live Crisis Point. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for part two.